Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Arnie Gunderson, an old friend, an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, a company who provide research, analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues. Arnie is an independent nuclear engineer and safety expert. He provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and officials throughout the US, Canada and indeed internationally. He's been a leading voice globally about the impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster and he joins us now once again. Welcome to the program, Arnie. Hi, Helen. Thanks. It's nice to be back again. <laughs> well, now, um, I needed to get you back because you've been saying some new things about Fukushima and I've got quite a lot of questions too. So I think, as usual, you need to give us a complete update of Units 1, 2, 3 and 4, where they stand, what your thinking is now and the like, please, Arnie. So the floor is yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, well, let's go 4, 3, 2, 1. That's um, for a change. Um, unit 4, the walls have been knocked down. Um, and uh, and that's a good thing. The plan is... What do you mean the walls have been knocked down? I don't know what you mean by that. Ah, well, the um, you know the explosion kind of devastated everything uh, for the last two floors of the nuclear reactor. So they've they've ripped out the remaining structures, and they um, uh, they're down at what we would call the operating floor. Well, you mean the building the building still stands, but they've taken out the two upper floors. Is that right? Yes. If the building was a hundred feet tall, now it's sixty feet tall. They've taken out all of the superstructure above the nuclear reactor, and, and, what, and that was a high. That was a very high bay area where the the massive cranes moved and uh, where the refueling bridges moved. Uh, so all of that has been removed, and um, there's going to be shortly um, essentially a flat area where um, where Tokyo Electric plans to work. Well, wait a minute. No, so so they've taken out the two upper floors, which were damaged anyway, where the cranes were. So you're left with the reactor containment vessel, and next to which is the cooling pool full of over a hundred tons of very radioactive fuel. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Right. Now the the plan is that once they do this, they'll build a building on top of the the rubble that's still there, the the, the refueling uh, pool especially, they will use the um, uh, existing foundation to uh, on one side, on the water side, uh, and then they'll build a new foundation on the land side to build a new bridge for this huge crane. Remember, there was a crane in there, but it collapsed, um, and uh, so they'll have to um, put a new crane in the reason it's such a monumental job is they need a crane that can lift a heavy spent fuel cask, and that weighs something on the order of 130 tons. So it's a huge crane. What? What? What a so, spent? What uh, is? Are you talking about a spent fuel bundle, or I don't understand what you mean? Uh, well, each bundle will have to get lifted and put into a shielded container underwater. Yeah. So as soon as those things come out of the water, uh, they're so highly radioactive they would they would kill the people on the operating floor. So all of this has to be done with the fuel pool full of water. So they'll lift out one bundle at a time, and of course the question is: Are the bundles distorted because of the heat, or have they been damaged because of all the rubble that fell into the pool? Uh, but in theory, anyway, they'll be able to go down and grab the bundle pull it out, still underwater, carry it to the side of the pool, and in underwater still there will be a huge canister. They'll lift the fuel into that huge canister, put a lid on it. That huge canister weighs something like 100 tons. Oh. They'll lift that up, put oh. that in the big crane, and lower that to the ground. And that will have to occur dozens of times and over over, you know, perhaps a year when they have to empty that fuel pool. Well then, okay, so wait a minute. 
each fuel bundle will be lifted up underwater and they'll, they'll have to bring... I, the canister is not yet in the pool, right? They'll have to make the canister and put it in the pool ready to receive each fuel bundle to be then transferred to the ground. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So the goal number one on that site is to get that pool empty. And it will take, um, once the building is built, it will take a year or two. So it's, they're not out of the woods by any means because if there were a seismic event and the pool were to drain, they could still have a, a fuel pool fire and, and uh, you know, contaminate uh, the, the entire country. So it's, it's um, improving because they are in the process. But, you know, Helen, they, they finally figured this out this year. I was on Chris Martinson's show back in June of last year in 2011, and I was saying you've got to build a building over the building. Yeah. And um, so they're very slow. And unfortunately, Mother Nature has her own timetable. So um, I view this as a battle against the clock, and I hope that uh, you know there won't be any major earthquake to destroy the building again. Well, now, um, how long is it going to take to reinforce the building? You say they've got to build a new wall on the far side from the ocean, on the land side, to, yeah. re to make it strong enough to be able to put this incredibly heavy crane on top of the building. How long will it take, A, to build the building, per se, before they, they can... They claim it'll take a year. A year. They so you've got a they'll... year to build the building. Then they've got to put the crane on top of the building. That probably won't take so long, right? Right. It's something on the order of 18 months from now they'll be able to move fuel. 18 months so before they move the fuel, and then it's going to take another year to totally remove the fuel from the pool. So we're That's talking right. about two and a half years. We're talking 2015 or 2016 before oh, that job's done. Yeah, yeah. So it's a and race. The last, fuel, yeah. the last fuel they move is the most radioactive, which is still the most dangerous. So removing the fuel at the beginning is actually the easy part. The, the last fuel is the newest fuel. And it's physically hot and, of course, has the most radiation. So that fuel will be the last stuff they move in perhaps 2014 or 2015, right? So when they get it down to the ground in this container weighing 100 tons and, and, each, and, and, and they move one fuel bundle at a time, how many, how many fuel rods in a fuel bundle, Arnie? Um, well, there's nine by nine, about 80. 80. In a, 90, yeah, 80 rods in a bundle, and, you know, there's uh, um, over a 1,000 bundles. So how that, much does a bundle, out, how much does a bundle weigh? Around a ton. A ton? And, yes, around a ton. So a, now you have to remember, the big problem is going to be, have these things been distorted by the earthquake or yeah. by heat during yeah. the, the process or by rubble falling on them? They may not be able to pull them. Oh. They may get onto them and, and try to lift. And they'll be jammed, and then so, what? You know, that's a then that's what? another problem, right? Um, so we'll, we'll see as as time develops. Unfortunately, they're they're taking way too long. So then they'll get them on the ground. They'll bring it over to the other fuel pool they've got there. They have oh. a huge pool. Then they'll empty it, and they'll do this process again and again and again. And gradually, they'll they'll um, once it's on the ground and in a canister, though. That's a lot better than having it up that high in the air in a damaged building. Well, now, so they're going to take it to the common fuel pool. The common fuel pool, how much spent fuel is presently in that common fuel pool, A, and B, where is it located? Um, it says about 7,000 bundles in the common fuel pool, and it's located on the water side of the nuclear reactors. It didn't flood after the tsunami. So it's a little bit uphill from uh, from the, the plant on the on the land side uh, of the of the of the plant. So the um, so they'll that, have to take seven, they'll have to take the oldest fuel out of that and put it into canisters on site for that that will stay there for you know decades. And then they'll take the stuff from Fukushima Daiichi Unit Four uh -huh. and put it into that because that that common pool. This chocker block full. 
Well, if it's got 7,000 bundles now and each bundle weighs a tonne, there are 7,000 tonnes of spent fuel in that common fuel pool. Right. And then each, you know, reactor 2, reactor 1, reactor 3 all has, you know, five, 600 uh, bundles. So there's, you know, if you do the math, there's, there's 50 or 60 uh, you know, uh, you know, 600 times a ton. There's 600 tons of material in each of those reactors. Yeah, there's a there's a huge amount of nuclear waste. There's 40 years of nuclear waste on that site. So um, yeah, they're gonna they have a lot. Plus, what's already in the dry cask storage, they have a dry cask facility on site too, and that survived the tsunami and the earthquake just fine. So the goal here is to get it all into dry casks over the next 10 years. Well, I've done the maths, and it seems like there's 8,800 tonnes of spent fuel at the site or maybe rounded off to 10,000 tonnes of spent fuel at just that site at the Fukushima Daiichi reactor complex, and that hasn't included spent fuel pools at units 5 and 6. So I wonder how much spent fuel... Uh, Japan has in toto Arnie Gunderson. Oh, I don't know, Helen. They're, they're all old plants, and uh, you know, some like Tokai only have two units, and, and Anagawa has three. So they they vary, but I'm sure you can. There's 50 reactors, and I'm sure you can say at least 600 bundles for each reactor, perhaps more. So that's 600 tons per reactor times 50 reactors. Um, you know, it's, it's a big number. Um, uh, so 30,000 yeah. tons. Um, yeah, that's, okay. That's well, the minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Minimum, more. Now, yeah. yeah. Now, the beauty of Unit 4 is that there's nothing in the nuclear reactor. So the, the, as they go up, as you go to 1, 2, and 3, of course, you've got to empty the fuel pools, and that's not clear, especially Unit 3, how much damage is in the fuel pool. I think the damage in Unit 3's pool is extensive. But then you've got to get in the nuclear reactors, on one, two, and three, and of course, the fuel is melted down there. So it's not as simple as grabbing the bundles and, and lifting them out. The um, the fuel is actually you know melted, and there's a blob on the bottom of the reactor if you're lucky, and in fact, more likely has leaked through the reactor, and it's a blob on the concrete. So it's uh, um, they're going to be much more difficult than Unit Four. Well, I mean, the only time they've ever tried to remove melted fuel was at Three Mile Island, and that took them 10 years, didn't it? Um, yeah, and that, that was But easy that now. wasn't really melted like the way these three mm. have really... Right. Re that way, TMI had um, a blob of nuclear fuel on the bottom, but it hadn't breached the vessel. Uh, all of these vessels have been breached. The control rods come in at the bottom, and they're leaking like a sieve, um, so... What fuel, uh, it is likely that fuel has oozed out through the control rods. If not burned its way right out, uh, it's, it's likely Unit 2 is, has burned its way right out and is now lying on the concrete. So, um, and I think that's really the, the big change in my uh, view of the problem is, um, is what they're finding in Units 1, 2, and 3 now. Wow. See, um, you got to, so let's think of the nuclear reactor as a pressure cooker, okay. and the nuclear reactor is in a containment, so we'll build a real strong box around the pressure cooker, mm. and then the containment is in another building called the tourist building and the reactor building, and then next to that building is the turbine building. So we've got like three or four different buildings here. We are finding in the turbine buildings, so we've got three different barriers before you ever get to the turbine building concentrations of radioactive material on the order of a million becquerels, a million disintegrations per second in a liter. So think of a liter of Coke and, and think of a million sparkles of light every second. That's the water, not in the nuclear reactor, not in the nuclear reactor containment, not in the reactor building, but further away in the turbine building. So what concerns me is... Um, yeah, is worker exposure at this point. I, I, I think that, um, uh, in my mind, is flipped on this. I thought 
eventually in 60 years or so they could dismantle these reactors. But I don't think that's fair to the workers at this point. The exposure these guys are going to get in the process of dismantling the reactors is going to be extraordinary. Now, a little bit of physics here. Um, the nuclear fuel is very hot in the first day and less hot the next day and less hot the next day. Um, it's still physically hot. You can still see steam coming off these buildings. But it's much less hot than it was after the accident. And about five years out, there's not a lot of heat coming off the nuclear fuel. So uh, five years out, a meltdown becomes impossible. So you have to cool. It's likely to be impossible now, but, but certainly five years out, it's, it's impossible. So you have to cool the nuclear reactor building and the nuclear reactor what's left of it for about five years. But after that, you can turn off the pumps. Oh, so and, they're still pouring water over the molten fuel. Yes. Seawater. Yes. It's probably not molten, Helen. It's probably uh, a solid lump that's very hot. Ah. Um, but, um, yeah, they're still pouring water over it to the tune of, uh, uh, you know, tens of tons a day for each reactor. And that water is coming, in, coming back out incredibly radioactive. And rather than pump it right back in, they, they are cleaning it with a demineralizer system that's very sophisticated, very expensive. But in the process now, they're creating hundreds of demineralizer resins. Think of like a Brita filter. Um, hundreds of those, but of course they're the size of a car, um, that are highly radioactive with cesium that's got a 300-year lifetime um, that they're putting out on a field behind the plant. And, and still, the concentration of radioactivity in the water is not going down because it's in direct contact with nuclear yeah. fuel. Yeah. So they've, they've contaminated the reactor, the, 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 the bottom of the containment, the torus, which is that donut-shaped thing, the uh, reactor building, which is outside that, the thing that blew up, the floor of that is contaminated, and the building next to it, the turbine hall, is uh, should be the least radioactive, and it's still a million disintegrations per second for every liter. So my my thought is now, um, considering the extent of this contamination, that it's not fair to the workers to have them go in and clean this. And I I think uh, um, if, if I were Tokyo Electric's management, a couple more years out after the cooling is completely done, I would consider filling up those those containment buildings with concrete and and walking away for 300 years you know obviously monitoring it but I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to the workers to um, to expose them to the extraordinary levels they'll receive if they um, if they were to uh, to try to uh, to turn that site back into a greenfield they couldn't turn it back into a greenfield that's ridiculous. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, of course, the big concern would be you've got to make sure you've got it all captured and it's not going down into the water table. But it, well, um, it will, it, and, and if you put concrete on it, you know it's going to keep going down into the water table, and you know it's going right. to keep contaminating the Pacific Ocean for the rest of time. Right. So the solution, there is no good solution. No, no there is absolutely no good. Is but the a, solution would be to bore holes underneath and constantly pull water out from under the building um, so oh. that whatever leaks down gets treated. So we're still back with these big demineralizers again. Uh, but I, I think, um, uh, to my mind, I, I couldn't, as a manager, um, order you know a couple thousand workers to pick up extraordinarily high exposures um, to dismantle these plants at this point in time. So, Ani, another question. Is there only one turbine building where the electricity is generated from the steam, or does each reactor building have its own turbine building? Each reactor building has its own turbine building. Well, which is They're the turbine building that's so radioactive with a million bacteria? Well, they all are. Uh, unit oh. 3 is worse. And it's interesting. Now, Unit 3 is contaminating Unit 4. What? And Unit what? 4, yes, they're connected. So we're finding water from Unit 3 leaking into Unit 4. And you know if it's leaking between the buildings, it's leaking into the ground next to the buildings, too. Yeah. And the question is, how is it getting out? And 
Uh, a good friend of mine is a, uh, was an electrical engineer for General Electric, and he told me how. He said, a containment is not a monolithic block. It's got pipes in it for the wires to go back and forth. Mm. Electrical wires go in and out, mm. and the wires are caulked with a rubber. Well, the rubber wasn't designed to handle this radiation level. Mm. The rubber wasn't designed to handle the heat, and the rubber wasn't designed to handle salt water. So all of these electrical penetrations between the reactor and all the other buildings on the site are leaking and are causing this radioactive material to move everywhere on the site. Oh, <laughs> I'm a little bit speechless. Okay, my next question. So it, the three turbine buildings each are exhibiting a million becquerels per litre of radiation. Is that correct? The worst one is Unit 3 is a million, and the others are around that. It, okay. I, I don't know precisely, but they're huge numbers. And, yeah. you know, certainly not something you would send somebody in to voluntarily uh, you know, scrub so the walls. So that indicates if in the turbine buildings, which is three buildings distant from the reactor itself, um, therefore you would extrapolate back and say that if the radiation is as high as that in the turbine buildings, it will be higher in each of the other buildings to the reactor itself, right? So you extrapolate. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, and, and if they dismantle this building, they still have the same radioactive material. Now they've got to move it someplace where it's clean. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So it very well may be that the Japanese will say, okay, we, we made a huge mistake, uh, in, but we're going to use the Fukushima site as the ultimate waste repository for everything we're finding on the site. Right. Rather than on contaminate the another location, yeah. this one, let's just call it a sacrifice and walk away. Yeah, but then you're sacrificing the Pacific Ocean and the people who eat the fish from the ocean and the people on, on the west coast of America and people in Australia because the fish swim everywhere. I mean, you are sacrificing... The Pacific by leaving this stuff there for the rest of time, which will leak and drain consistently into the Pacific. You're you're right. It needs to be constantly pumped out for 100, 200 years until they want to go back in and dismantle it. Yeah, but you know um, what? Are, what are our descendants going to say? There are three generations per hundred years. So, say for the next three hundred years, that's nine generations of people. How will they be thinking? <laughs> Will they be doing it? Will they want to do it? Will they have the will they have the apparatus to do it and the knowledge and you know I mean we yep. are assuming an awful lot, Arnie. We're assuming people nine generations from now think the same way that we think. I know. We and we also think that society will be functioning three hundred yeah. years at at least as high a level as we are. Um and um uh, and we also have to figure where's all this money gonna come from? Um, I don't see the international community saying, here's Japan, here's a half a trillion dollars. It's coming out of the Japanese treasury. Now, they're not admitting that. The Japanese are not admitting that their treasury is going to take a, a half a trillion dollar hit. You know, that right now it's uh, 10 trillion this month or 10 trillion this quarter and 10 trillion another half a year out. But nobody's looking at the big picture and realizing that, I'm, I'm sorry, 10 billion, 10 billion, 10 billion. Mm. Nobody's looking at the big picture here and saying, when you add up all of this for 50 or 60 or 100 years, you're looking at a half a trillion dollar expenditure. Um, Japan's population is aging and declining, so they're carrying a huge burden on an aging, uh, shrinking population. It's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a great situation, that's for sure. Well, let alone the number of malignancies and diseases that are going to accrue from this accident. I mean, we know that the data from Chernobyl shows that within the first 25 years, up to a million people have died. And we're going to talk about the next 300 years or 600 years as long as cesium remains radioactive. But there are other elements that remain radioactive for hundreds thousands if not millions of years and they're similarly in the mix as is the cesium and so if you and and you have said yourself Arnie Gunderson that you think the Fukushima releases of radiation were 2.5 to three times 
greater than those from Chernobyl. So, and the Japanese population is much more densely situated than people living around Chernobyl. So if you multiply one million in the first 25 years by 2.5 or 3 from your data, you could end up with a figure like 3 million people dying in the first 25 years in Japan. Oh, well, I'm at a million. I am, uh, um, you know, feel the nuclear industry uh, is, is obviously throwing barbs at my number, but they're claiming that maybe 100 people will die of cancer. Oh, that's from ridiculous. But uh, I use Steve Wing's data from Three Mile Island. And, uh, you know, he shows pretty clearly that 10,000 people died of cancer from Three Mile Island. And, of course, we know a million at, at, uh, at Chernobyl. So it, it seems to me, based on the fact that we had larger releases after Fukushima in a higher population zone, uh, that, um, that a million people is certainly uh, credible. The, the difference around Chernobyl is that on one side of Fukushima you have water where mm. Chernobyl was land all the way around. But um, um, it's, uh, you know, but the, the, the industry knows that the, uh, um, there, there will be, Japan's got a population of 140 million, and if you, um, about, about a third die of cancer. So you're looking at roughly 40 or 50 million over that time period will normally die of cancer. So if I'm right and there's a million people, that's only a 2% increase. It's, and so it will be extraordinarily hard to measure if you're not looking for it. Oh, but and people I think what, will be, they will be doing epidemiological studies, and I think that you're underestimating that number because do you still stand by your data that 2.5 to 3 times more radiation escaped from Fukushima than Chernobyl? Well, that was uh, certainly, uh, I'm certain of that for yeah. the noble gases. Yeah. For the xenon and krypton, um, there's, uh, there's measured data um, in the northwest quadrant for the first week of the accident yeah. where every cubic meter, you know, three feet by three feet by three feet of air was, um, was 1,000 becquerels per, um, 1,000 disintegrations per second for every cubic meter up that way. Now that's got to be causing, you know, lung cancers and and uh, whole body exposures that the industry is not willing to uh, to address. The other thing is that they found that um, um, apparently on March sixteenth, uh, um, Unit Two um, had an internal explosion. It looks fine if you look at Unit Two from the outside. Mm. It doesn't look bad at all. But it cracked the containment at the same time the operators had all of the vents open in the nuclear reactor. And a huge cloud of radiation was released on the 16th, and the wind was blowing toward Tokyo. Right. Now, there's, there's not a lot of radiation monitors that early in the accident. You know, there's chaos within Japan and Tokyo Electric. And yet, no one is re really willing to say, oh, my God, what was the exposure in Tokyo on March 15, 16, 17, um, there's not a lot of good data. And what data there is, uh, the Japanese are consistently downplaying. They're, they're underestimating the, um, the exposure. But, you know, I was in Tokyo back in, back in February, and I found on the ground uh, 7,000 disintegrations per second in every kilogram of soil. That's, that would qualify as radioactive waste in the States. And, uh, and the Japanese government is saying, you know, don't worry, be happy, um, uh, smile. Business, business as usual, right? They say smile. <laughs> okay, so we've we've a stat, and so the point I was making by the number of diseases, not just cancer and leukemia, but diabetes, premature aging in children, increased incidence of cataracts, increased incidence of severe congenital anomalies that we've seen in Chernobyl, and in fact. Today I'm going to interview a pediatrician who is a specialist in teratology, meaning damage to fetuses, um, about the, the incidence of congenital anomalies around Chernobyl, which is still ongoing, incidentally. We'll be seeing that around Fukushima for sure in the population. So we're not just talking about malignancies. There are many other diseases related to radiation exposure. And so what I wanted to point out as a physician is that the expense to the Japanese government and the people in general to care for these people and try and treat them is going to be enormous, and that is not being factored into the accident at the moment. 
Right. You know, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, on top of that is the, is the generational genetic damage. Uh, oh, yeah. There was a study out just last week about the, the radioactive butterfly uh, damage. And uh, um, the, the, what they're finding is that in successive generations, the genetic damage is getting worse. Uh, so that three generations of butterflies seem to have more genetic damage than the first, the first generation. So, um, um, you know, there's obviously a lot more study needs to be done here, but um, we're looking at, uh, you know, a damaged gene pool uh, that won't manifest itself in 10 years or 20 years. It will manifest itself in a generation or two. That, that's the most serious part of the accident and of anything nuclear. It's called genomic progression, genomic progression. Um, now, I've got some other questions, Arnie. You said earlier in the accident that, that a lot of hydrogen was building up in the buildings units 1, 2, and 3, and they were injecting nitrogen into the buildings to dilute the hydrogen so there would not be a hydrogen explosion. Is the hydrogen still building up? Um, well, they, and they failed. I mean, unit one, two, three, and four um, all blew up uh, from hydrogen explosions. Um, um, they may have had different causes and things like that. And I believe unit three started as a hydrogen explosion, but then became something called a prompt moderated criticality, which is worse. Um, uh, interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking it a little bit off topic here, but. Um, there was a Japanese study which is now calling the explosion in Unit 3 a detonation, not a deflagration. And that has to do with the speed at which the wave front traveled. And there's no containment in the world that can withstand a detonation shock wave. So um, that's something the nuclear industry doesn't want to address. But uh, we, we now have um, a TMI had an explosion, but it was a deflagration. Unit 1 at Fukushima had an explosion, but it was a deflagration, a slower-moving shockwave. But Unit 3's explosion now, you know, by authorities other than Arnie Gunderson, are now calling it a detonation. Meaning and that? Well, that means that the shockwave travels faster than the speed of sound, and it cracks the concrete or yeah, the but steel. Yeah, but what caused the explosion? You were saying it probably wasn't a hydrogen explosion. Was it a nuclear excursion? Well, it's not, I, I think it's something called a prompt moderated criticality. What's that? It, it, it's not a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb, the, the rate at which the explosion grows is it doubles every millionth of a second. Um, a prompt moderated criticality doubles every thousandth of a second. Now, it's still a blink of an eye, but um, the, the, what you saw at, uh, at Unit um, 3 um, was a... Uh, uh, a slower doubling than a nuclear bomb, but much faster than uh, nuclear reactors are designed to handle. So was it a moderated nuclear explosion? The moderated means that the neutrons left the, the uranium atom uh, very fast, but then they, they bumped into water and they attenuated and became what we call thermal neutrons. We're really getting into a lot of nuclear physics here. But the, the net effect is that the growth rate of the explosion in Unit 3 was was moderated, which means it doubled every thousandth of a second. But it was a so nuclear in, in, explosion. It was not not hydrogen, but nuclear. Would you say that? In my opinion, it was a prompt moderated criticality. Which I'm not going to call it a nuclear explosion because that, that would be a prompt, unmoderated criticality, and and I don't believe that happened. Uh, you know, but it the, was related the to the nuclear fuel. Yes, but it was it, the rate at which it grew. I won't call it a nuclear explosion. Okay, you're being very careful, Arnie. <laughs> but you still haven't <laughs> uh, you still haven't answered my question. Is hydrogen still building up in units one, ah, two, and three? Please. You're right. I haven't answered. Yes, uh, hydrogen still is building up. Um, because of electrolysis with water. The, the gamma rays from the fuel are crashing into water and uh, creating oxygen and hydrogen. So they still have to inject nitrogen into those vessels all the time. Oh. Um, so you'll see that, um, uh, as a matter of fact, just recently they put a little bit too much nitrogen in and they wound up with these puffs of radiation coming out. If they put in too much, um, they'll squeeze too much radiation out. So they're trying to maintain the nitrogen 
without forcing more and more radiation out. But the containments are leaking like sieves, and, and uh, again, for five or six or seven years, um, they are going to continue to create hydrogen. And the only way to, to prevent that from exploding again is to, um, is to feed in nitrogen, which is inert. So there, therefore, still is a risk of a hydrogen explosion in Units 1, 2, or 3? Yes. My God. What about steam explosions? You talked about that initially too, Arnie Gunderson. Yeah, the, the decay heat is now low enough um, that, um, the, 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 um, uh, that the blob is sort of hot but solid as opposed to molten. Uh, so uh, we won't get steam explosions at this point. We're uh, far enough along in the accident where these blobs of nuclear fuel are still physically hot, but not hot enough to um, uh, to turn into molten lava anymore. Okay. Now, how much radiation would you estimate is still escaping every day from Units 1, 2, and 3, which are leaking like sieves, to quote you? Oh, geez. Um, I'm sure it's, um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it's a billion becquerels a day um, from, you know, from both water and, and gaseous. So, uh, you know, a billion disintegrations per second of radiation um, in a day. And, of course, once that billion leaks out, it's going to continue to to decay, but just not in the reactor as it moves around the world. It will... Uh, continues to decay. Now, a billion is a big number, but the the initial accident had, uh, you know, about 12 more zeros behind it. So compared to the first day or week of the initial accident, it's small, but compared to an operating nuclear plant where everything is just fine, it's huge. A billion so, um, becquerels per day, because you said a billion disintegrations per second. That's not a billion becquerels per day. No, a billion disintegrations per second per day. So every um, day they're going to they're going to be releasing about a billion becquerels of, uh, of radiation. Oh, one billion becquerels. Okay, because yeah. a becquerel is a becquerel is a billion a dis disintegration per second. A disintegration per second. So uh, so initially, what was the size of the release? You say you've oh God. It had 15 zeros behind it. Uh, so I don't even know what that one, number two, is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think nine, they, they're measuring 10, it in terabecquerel. Um, What's a terabecquerel? Like, that's 15 zeros. 15 zeros. It was like 100,000 terabecquerel. So it's pushing 20 zeros worth of, uh, of zero. You know, 20 just, uh, zeros. 20, 20 zeros. Yeah. I put a day. one with 20 zeros behind it, and that's roughly. Uh, I don't have my calculator here with me, Helen, but it's uh, it's it was a it was a hundred thousand um, petabecquerels. Now, peta is 10 to the 15. Peta, peta, peta becquerels. Yeah. So that's one by 10 to the 20. One by 10 to the 20. Roughly, yeah. It's one by 10 to the 18th. It really doesn't matter. It's such a huge number. Um, and what are the what are the elements cont pr producing that extraordinary amount of radiation? Well, name you know, it, them. Uh, initially, the initial burst, of course, were xenon and krypton, noble gases, and you and I talked about that. And they're fat soluble, and you use them in uh, in hospitals. Yes. To, um, A high, um, very then, course, very high energy gamma emitters. Yes. Yes. Then, of course, after that comes the iodine. Um, now that only has an eight-day half-life, but it's selectively absorbed by um, uh, by thyroids. There's a good study out, uh, I think, last week that shows in Hiroshima victims the kids continue to have thyroid problems, you know, up into their fifties and sixties and seventies. So um, the it used to be thought that if you got through the first couple of years, you're out of the woods, but for the children who are you know whose thyroids are growing. Um, um, apparently that's not true and that they're seeing continual thyroid problems uh, essentially for life for the kids that were uh, attached to, who had the Yes, they the, still, uh, the, yeah. the children in Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were 
affected mostly by external gamma radiation, there wasn't a lot of internal radiation from radioactive iodine, even now, so many years later, how many years is it? It's 45, it's uh, well, 50, 60, 60 years later, are still yeah, developing yeah. thyroid cancers. And um, one-third of thyroid cancers metastasize and kill their the patients. Um, so, But we're also now seeing within the first 18 months after Fukushima, They've examined 18,000 children under the age of 15 or 18 in Fukushima Prefecture. 30, no, 38,000, sorry, 38,000 or so. And 36% of them are th showing thyroid cysts and or nodules by ultrasound examination. And they are not being biopsied to see if the cells are malignant. That is really gross medical irresponsibility um, and they're downplaying it and they're not uh, really informing the parents what it means. Um, the, the number I heard in comparison is that a normal population of children of that age has 1%. 1%. So clearly yeah. these kids are, are this off is 36%, the chart. With, that's off the chart. But it's early, Siana. You don't expect to see in, in, uh, here in uh, Chernobyl... They didn't see thyroid tumours until three to four years post-accident. This is in the first 18 months. So therefore you would assume that these children got a whopping dose of radioactive iodine into their thyroid glands by inhalation and ingestion, ingestion of contaminated food. Um, right. and, and that's if, the if tip of the, the iceberg. Have... That, that indicates that lots of other cancers are going to start developing too from internal emitters that get into their livers, their heart, their brain, their muscles, their bones and the like. Yes. And it, it um, you know, and also we, we talked about noble gases, we talked about iodine and all of the other ones, which everybody seems to lump into cesium, but it's cesium-134, cesium-137. It's, uh, you know, strontium and rubidium and on and on and on. Um, well, you know, you give us, you're a nuclear engineer. Give us some of the others. Just name them, Arnie, so people well, have an idea. I'm most, I'm most concerned about uranium. We're finding uranium in samples, which indicates, you know, fuel melt and stuff like that. And, and as a heavy element, we're surprised to be able to, to pick it up, uh, you know, a couple hundred miles away. One of the samples I took in Tokyo had uranium in it. So that's an, just an indication of a gross core breach and, uh, uh, and things like that. So you know, we're finding um, um, there's some data out of Europe that talks about dust in homes. Uh, and the homes are 100 miles away. And we're looking at per, per uh, kilogram, so for 2.2 pounds, um, 100,000 disintegrations per second in a kilogram of dust. Now, that's a lot of dust, but, but it, the Japanese sleep on the floor. Mm. So people 100 miles out are sleeping in a radioactive dust that's going to be, you know, causing either lung ingestion or mouth ingestion, et cetera. So they're not out of the woods, and I, I think you were getting to the point uh, a minute ago that we've got a, a government that doesn't want to admit, and a medical community that will march in lockstep with the government, unfortunately. I think they've forgotten the hypocritic oath. You know. But they, um, they are, uh, in a lot of cases, refusing to say that um, these illnesses are radiation-induced. Well, we're not seeing the radiation-induced illnesses yet, except for the thyroid abnormalities in these children, although we are now starting to see uh, low white blood cell counts, which could be a preliminary indicator of leukemia developing, um, and apparently abnormal lung function in children. Uh, there's a lot of there are, people are reporting a lot of nosebleeds in children, which means that their platelet count may be low, damaged by radiation exposure. Um, so there are indicators, but you see these are only anecdotes. And in medicine, you can't just take an anecdote and say, look, this is because of this, this, and this. You have to do an epidemiological study, 
compare an exposed population and their diseases to a non-exposed population, and that takes many years. A, B, it's expensive, and C, I, at the moment it doesn't seem like the doctors want to do that. Um, and so, and the other thing is that I'm finding it very difficult to get real data from the hospitals about the, the actual tests they're doing in their patients and what the real tests are showing. And without that data, I can't make judgments, nor can any other physician. Uh, so we're, we're like in the dark, you know, stumbling around in the dark, not really knowing what's going on. But clearly, indicators would suggest that things um, are looking grim in Japan. You know, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal just this weekend, and basically they came to exactly the opposite conclusion. They said that the tragedy of Fukushima is that they shut the nuclear plants down, and and um, they estimate 100 people were killed or will be killed over 30 years from the, the numbers. Yeah, and that was... I went through this. Yeah, go on. I went through this on Three Mile Island as an expert, and the industry did the same thing then. They underestimate the release. They underestimate the dose from the release. They underestimate the population that receives the exposure, and they totally forget about internal emitters. And the net effect of that is you come up with these crazy low numbers. Yeah, well, that article in the Wall Street Journal was written by a physicist. How dare he? He doesn't understand radiobiology. He's, as you say, ignoring internal emitters. How dare he? These people are worse than apologists. I mean, you, ca you must not lie in science, and particularly you must not lie when it comes to medicine. Because if you lie when it comes to medicine, you're going to be damaging or killing patients. If we lied in medicine, you know, we'd be deregistered. You can't practice medicine by lying. These people have no right to even comment because they don't know what they're talking about. Or if they do, they're actually lying and they're criminals, I would say, because... Because by lying, people don't know the truth and they can't protect themselves or understand and it will, the ignorance will lead to illness and possibly deaths in the future. This, this is a really, really serious issue, Arnie. You know, my, my biggest, the thing that makes me the most upset about the, um, the Japanese government uh, and the Japanese infrastructure is, you know, doctors all over the world take the Hippocratic oath. It's and not it's hypocritic, it's Hippocratic. Actually, you're true, it sounds like Hippocratic, but it's Hippocratic. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. So they've taken the, they've taken the Hippocratic oath in Japan, apparently. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but you're right. It, it concerns me that, that doctors are putting the welfare of the state in front of the welfare of their patients. I know. It just takes my breath away. Now, I've got another question unrelated to what we've been discussing, but it, it occurred to me in the last week, thinking about all of this, you know the water they use to cool the spent fuel pool? Is that extremely radioactive? And what happens to it? Does it get recirculated all the time? Is it as radioactive as the water that is used to cool the primary, the, the reactor itself? The primary coolant is the cooling water that cools the spent fuel pool the same level of radiation as the water that's used to cool a reactor. Um, unit four has the least radioactivity in it um, compared to the other fuel pools, um, and but all of them run through a filter system and get pumped back into the, the reactor. So. Um, they are much more radioactive than any fuel pool in any picture you see. You know, that pristine water in a fuel pool, uh, um, they are, the, the fuel is damaged, so clearly it's leaking in the fuel pool. The fuel is destroyed in the nuclear reactors, so clearly it's leaking more. Mm. So what we're seeing uh, coming, the, the fuel pools have a separate cooling system uh, from the reactors, oh. and that water is still cleaned and still filtered, but is nowhere near as contaminated from the beginning to the um, to the water that's in the um, uh, uh, in the reactors. But yes, it is contaminated. One last question before we end, Arnie Gunderson: What is Japan going to do with all its radioactive spent fuel? Um, 
that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm going to Japan next uh, next week, mm-hmm. so from August 27th till the fe- September 7th, and that will be one of the things I'm talking about. Um, the the nuclear establishment never ever talked about what how does it how does this game play out in the end? Where are we going to put the fuel? Um, they always talked about well we can reprocess it. Of course that hasn't worked. The Manju reactor mm-hmm. is, um, has had several accidents and is about a hundredfold more expensive than anybody thought it would be. Um, on an island that's so um, seismically faulted, there is no place to put the fuel. I think they were hoping to, you know, to send it to Mongolia or something like that. Oh, so really? Mongolians got smart and said, we don't want it. Um, it was uh, the game plan. The, the last move in this game was never thought of in Japan. They never said, we live on the most seismically active piece of rock on the planet, where are we going to put the fuel? And, and then work backward from there. Mm. Instead, they created the plants, they created the waste, and now uh, you know people like you and I are asking, what's the end game here? And uh, uh, I don't think anybody knows what the end game is. I think some people are thinking about sending it to Australia. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, uh, I, I firmly believe the Japanese were hoping to export it somewhere um, because every seismologist I've ever spoken to said you, there's no place in Japan to put that nuclear waste that yeah. you can assure it will stay out of harm's way for a thousand years, let alone you know, a, a quarter of a million years. Yeah, well, you know who built the railway line that transports radioactive waste and will transport it through the centre of Australia, Halliburton. You know who was the CEO of Halliburton, don't you, Arnie? Yes, Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney, yeah. That bodes ill for Australia, and they've they've found a place on Aboriginal tribal land just next to that railway a line uh, called Muckety Station, which sits atop a shallow aquifer, um, which may communicate with our ancient archaeological water, the Great Artesian Basin, that waters much of the desert of Australia, um, and that's where they're proposing to put our small amount of radioactive waste, but there is a deal that seems to be going on between America and Australia called the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, signed by George Bush and John Howard, our former Prime Minister, that we may be importing other people's radioactive waste, including maybe from America, and you could extrapolate and say possibly from Japan because much of the uranium in those reactors was Australian fuel, Australian uranium. So uh, things look grim from every which way at the moment. Um, you know, I've been saying, I've been saying that uh, if the, the, the proponents of nuclear power say, of course it's safe and... And you got to believe us that we know how to store the nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years. And the the same people who are saying that are saying you, you can't build solar because we haven't figured out a way of storing electricity overnight. <laughs> well, if if we can store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, we can certainly figure out a way of storing electricity overnight and go to a renewable economy. Well, we can because solar thermal reactors are now being built in Spain and elsewhere using liquid salt and other such things, molten salt. So that's that's a furphy to say that. And I'll end by saying what I say to the nuclear industry when they say don't worry we'll work out what to do with radioactive waste I say look that's like me saying to you you've got pancreatic carcinoma you'll probably die within six months but don't worry I'm a really good doctor within 20 years I'll find the cure (laughs) well thank you very much for having me Helen (laughs) thank you Arnie once again we love you my guest today on if you love this planet was Arnie Gunderson an energy advisor with over 30 years of nuclear power engineering experience in the United States, one of our most popular guests. That's why we keep having him to update us on the Fukushima disaster, which is ongoing for virtually the rest of time, as you heard today. Mm-hmm.